Good afternoon. Welcome to the fourth session of This is Film, Film Heritage in Practice. My name is Giovanna Fossati. I'm the chief curator of I Film Museum and professor of film heritage and digital film culture at the University of Amsterdam. This is Film is a collaboration between I Film Museum, the University of Amsterdam, and the Amsterdam School for Cultural Analysis. Throughout the sessions, the master students of the This is Film class help introducing and interviewing our guests. Welcome to all the This is Film students, those here and those following remotely. This is Film is also available online. The lectures and Q&A can be found on the I website for free. And most of the films screened during the sessions are available on the i streaming platform, the iFilm Player, for a small fee. This year, we are focusing on the theme of recycle, reuse, and remix of archival films. Throughout the six sessions, we explore various aspects of film archival reuse and discuss ethical, legal, political, and aesthetic questions related to the reuse of archival films. As usual, each uh, session of this is film includes an introduction, a Q&A with expert guest speakers, and a screening. To introduce today's topic, I would like to start by looking at what film restoration and film reappropriation mean. What is film restoration? In general, we can say that film restoration defines those actions that are undertaken to bring a film back to a form that is as close as possible to its original one. With film, differently than with the restoration of other arts, a copy needs to be made since original films are too fragile to be projected without the risk of further damage. Problems, problems arise when we try to define what should be considered the original of a film. Several answers are possible, depending, for example, if one considers the textual level, for instance, uh, the plot, the editing, the credits, or the material level, for example, the 35 millimeter celluloid film negative the film has originally been shot on, or the surviving 16 millimeter reduction of a film originally shot on 35, or the original colors of a film that has faded. To restore a film being true to the original can mean a whole spectrum of different things. On the textual level, for example, the film as it was shown at its premiere can be considered as the original, or the film the director originally wanted before it was altered by the production company or by the uh, censorship. When considering film as a material artifact, the original black and white camera negative of a silent film can be considered as original, or the derived film prints in which colors were added in post-production by uh, uh, techniques such as stenciling, tinting, or toning. The discussion on the original in restoration is central to film archival practice and to the work of film restorers, who are responsible to interpret and decide which original they are going to restore. As I will show in a few minutes, it is in that act of interpretation that lies the blurred line between restoration and reappropriation. But first, what is reappropriation? The online glossary of art terms of the Museum of Modern Art in New York defines it as the stra art artistic strategy that includes the intentional borrowing, 
copying and alteration of pre-existing images, objects and ideas. Examples of reappropriation in visual art, as well as in its youngest discipline, film, are countless. Some examples of reappropriation in films fall into the category of remakes, others in that of the so-called found footage films. We have encountered the found footage films in the first session of This is Film, with Film East by Gustav Deutsch, in which the filmmaker reuses a wide variety of source material, such as ethnographic, war, porn, science, and fiction film ex excerpts from silent and early sound films he found in archi archival collections around the world. Other examples of found footage films that, similarly to Film East, reflect on the film medium itself are Peter Del Peut's Lyrical Nitrate and Bill Morrison's Decasia. After this very brief introduction to what restoration and reappropriation mean, when we discuss film, let's move on to today's topic by addressing the question, when does the line between restoration and reappropriation becomes blurred? As we already said, when restoring a film, a number of decisions or interpretations need to be made. The interpretations mainly regard the original film the restorer aims to restore. These interpretations are based on research about how the film looked and sounded like when it was originally shown and on the surviving film elements. Very often this information is inconclusive, incomplete or damaged. It is then up to the uh, to restorers to fill in the blanks with their own interpretation of how the film had probably looked and or sounded like at the time. This can be the case in terms of editing, colors, sound, contrast, definition, and many more variables. In the last two decades, with the digitization of the restoration process, much more is possible in terms of restoration of all these aspects. This abundance of tools brings with it a renewed ethical discussion about the extent to which films should be restored and about where to draw the line between restoring and creating new, improved versions. Very interesting discussions on this gray area have been triggered by specific restoration projects. An example is the restoration of the film Seemann's Frauen, Seemann's Wives, directed by Hank Kleinman in 1931. Originally meant to be the first Dutch sound film, it became one of the last Dutch silent films. Seemann's Frauen was restored as a silent film by iFilm Museum in 1984, based on the only surviving 35 millimeter print. In 2002, iFilm Museum produced and released a new version of Seemann's Frauen, with a completely new soundtrack by Dutch composer Henny Frinten, including a music score, dialogues with voices by contemporary actors and sound effects. This new version of Seemann's Frauen was an experiment in many ways. While Frinten composed an original score, Dutch writer Lodovic de Boer wrote dialogues based on the homonymous theatrical play by Hermann Bauber. And on the deciphering by professional lip reader of what the actors were actually saying in the silent film. The sound version of Seemann's Frauen is a film that never existed before, other than maybe in the director's mind. 
From this perspective, the limits of film restoration ethics were challenged and the sound version of Seemann's Frauen should be seen as a new version of the film rather than a restoration. Another example is that of the digital restoration of Le Voyage dans la Lune, made by Georges Méliès in 1902 and restored in 2011 by Serge Brombert at Lobster Films. Based on a surviving incomplete and heavily damaged hand color print, this restoration reconstructed the colors throughout the film, even where no reference existed. It removed all damages and all the signs of celluloid, including film grain, and it added a modern soundtrack by the French electronic band Air. This project spurred lively discussions among experts in the field. In response to critiques about the choices made for this restoration, Bromberg replied that he made use of the most advanced digital tools to free us, the viewers, from the physical celluloid medium and to show us directly what the camera operator saw at the time while making the film. A very similar consideration is made by Peter Jackson when interviewed about his aim with the film They Shall Not Grow Old. This title is indeed another very fitting example of the blurred line between restoration and reappropriation, which we will further discuss in today's session. It is my pleasure to introduce Achille Beise, Jervis Gray, Freddie O'Connell, Irem Argul, and Megan Trapp, who will take over from now. On behalf of the group, Irem will introduce our guests. Thank you, Giovanna. And now I will introduce our guests for today, David Walsh and Matthew Lee, and provide a brief background on their educational and professional careers, their role within They Shall Not Grow Old, and their current and future projects. David Walsh received an MA in chemistry at Oxford University in 1974. His fascina fascination with film led him to joining the Imperial War Museum in 1975, where he undertook a project to study the decomposition of cellulose nitrate film. From the starting point, he became heavily involved in all aspects of the work of the Imperial War Museum Film and Video Archive, becoming head of preservation in the 1990s. With the museum's growing reliance on digital technology, he found himself increasingly acting as the bridge between the technical and curatorial and was appointed head of digital collections in 2012, working particularly on the museum's strategy for digitization and digital preservation, but still acting as the main re repository of film preservation knowledge. His part in the making of They Shall Not Grow Old was confined to selecting footage for the producers based primarily on its picture quality, something that could largely be inferred from each reel's per preservation history, thus underlining the importance of good preservation metadata. He joined the Technical Commission of the International Federation of Film Archives in 2006 and served as its head from 2011 to 2016. Since 2016, he has been FIAF's training and outreach coordinator, taking a lead in defining and implementing FIAF's training initiatives around the world and offering assistance and advice to those seeking to preserve their film collections, large and small. Moving on to our second guest for today, Matthew Lee is the head of film at Imperial War Museums, vice chair of Film Archives UK and a member of the London Screen Archives Steering Group. After studying English and later film history, the glamorous world of film archiving lured Matt away from the Czech Republic, where he had been, in his words, masquerading as an English teacher. He has been a film curator for 20 years at, in, at the Imperial War Museum and was also the Imperial War Museum Short Film Festival director from 2013 to 2017. While not delving into the murky waters of Devonshire lineage, he takes an interest in questions of fakery and reconstruction in nonfiction film, colorization and avant-garde and experimental propaganda film. 
He was part of the Imperial War Museum team that commissioned They Shall Not Grow Old and was the internal curatorial lead on the project. At the moment, he is working on a restoration of the 1917 film The German Retreat and the Battle of Arras, a film dealing with the aftermath of the German retreat to the Hindenburg Line and the Battle of Arras. I will now give the stage to Matthew and David for their presentation. Thank you. Um, I suspect you're wondering how the Imperial War Museum um, managed to get to work with Peter Jackson. Well, it all started in 2012, almost eight years ago, um, and we started to make our plans to mark the centenary of the First World War in 2014. And one of the ideas we had was for a major film release or an artistic um, commission. Um, and one of the things we thought about was a traditional film restoration. Um, but when we kind of proposed that to our senior management team, they didn't really think it was ambitious enough. It needed to be braver, bolder. They didn't think it would actually capture enough of the public's imagination. Um, and perhaps if we had have pursued that line, um, I wouldn't be here talking to you today because we went down a very different road. Um, so in 2013, a project group was set up um, and we decided that we wanted to do something a little bit more controversial, but also braver in terms of engaging an audience. Um, our, our outline goals were really to foster an understanding of the First World War, but also provide a springboard for people to learn more about film itself and particularly younger audiences who we feel didn't really understand much about the medium and the history of the conflict that took place over 100 years ago. So really, we were trying to give people the opportunity to relate to history in a different way. Um, we considered many directors um, at the time, but one name kept on popping up, and that was Peter Jackson, um, because we considered this public history. Um, why Peter Jackson? I mean, why the Academy Award winner? You know, he's a huge storyteller he is. Um, it might have been obvious for some, but what people didn't know as well was he was incredibly knowledgeable and passionate about the First World War. Um, he has aeroplanes, he has a museum of items that relate to the conflict. And he himself said that he'd always been fascinated by the First World War due to the family history connections that he himself had and he always wanted to tell stories about ordinary people in extraordinary ways and I think that was the kind of guiding principle that led him to actually make They Shall Not Grow Old. Um, I mean he did this at the minimum um, the Union Membership Directors Guild rate, um, he put money of his, from his own production company into this production, um, he had creative and editorial autonomy of the production. I mean, the Imperial War Museum and 1914, we commissioned the film, but we, we entrusted the whole project to him. We didn't actually ask too many questions as the years went past. Um, it was really in his gift and, and we trusted the relationship and what he would supply to us. Um, how did it come about? Well, we, we supplied mainly 2K scans, um, full DPX, full frame DPX, I should say, for the production. And we sent him hundreds of First World War films. Um, and that was in 2014, 2015. And then we waited. Um, this project, the gestation period, was a number of years. Um, it wasn't until about 2016 that we discovered ourselves that there was a plan to colorize the film. Um, I'll be honest, that came as a surprise to us. Perhaps it shouldn't have come to a as a surprise to us, um, given what we know about what he likes to do in terms of CGI, digital wizardry, that kind of you know groundbreaking technical innovation. Um, so that started off, I would probably say, a kind of degree of anxiety with some of my colleagues and myself in the film archive. Um, we then sort of found out a little bit more about the film, and then we learned it was there was going to be a three D version. Um, so we quickly realised that he was doing something quite dramatic with the source material. And this kind of created a, an internal dialogue about the appropriateness of that. Um, we know this isn't how we would normally undertake a film restoration, which we kind of understood would be part of what he was doing when he was dealing with the original material. Um, and whilst there is a, a spectrum 
of opinions on the subject with regard to how you go about a restoration. I mean, it's pretty much standard, the standard viewpoint that, you know, colorization is normally considered bad if you're dealing with black and white film. Um, but the museum's position, and, and one I came to kind of agree with in the end, is that actually this was an exceptional and artistic centenary related project. Um, it wasn't something um, that we would normally set out to do, but we felt the circumstances had put us in a position where actually dealing with it in this way gave us the best opportunity to get some of our messages out there so we could actually have these wider discussions about film archiving not and not keep them behind closed doors or only to a, a small number of people. It was actually to make this debate a little bit more mainstream and get people to understand what's actually involved in film archiving and, and restoration work more generally. Um, of course, the films themselves, we still hold the originals. Um, the colour material that you see in They Shall Not Grow Old um, is certainly circulating out there, but the vast majority of this material um, in its original form is accessible on our website. So people could compare the original material and actually see what Peter Jackson has done with it. And, and a number of researchers, PhD students have actually started to do that, to actually look at the detail of what's been undertaken when this work um, was put into, put into train really. And I think it's always worth remembering that film has always been an incredibly malleable medium. And I think digital technology and just gives us even more ways and opportunities to repurpose and mash up the past. Um, what I would say though, I mean, we, we don't consider this a work of a, res a restoration. Um, I don't really consider it a documentary as such. I, I think it's more in the line of a, a film essay, uh, one that is exploring the possibilities of digital technology and archive film, but for a mainstream audience. I mean, it's not like what Bill Morrison's doing, certainly, although there are similarities. Um, what we really wanted to do here, I think, actually was break a bit of ground. And um, colorization is, itself isn't new. It's often been used in, te in television documentaries, particularly around actuality material relating to war and conflict. But I think by us commissioning it, it, it kind of changed the dynamic of the way archives sometimes work in that they sometimes begrudgingly provide material for documentarians to adapt, to colorize and to change. Whereas I think ultimately, although it was a journey where we didn't necessarily know what the goal was, as we went along with, along with it, it made us, I think, reassess some of the things that we'd considered that were perhaps inappropriate or not the done thing. And I think it's been an interesting journey for us as archivists and curators with this project. And we're still learning quite a lot about the film as we carry on. Um, I'll now hand over to David as well, and he can talk a little bit about the film too. Well, thank you, Matthew, for that, um, for that introduction of how we got to where we uh, arrived at. Um, I, I just want to talk about some of the technical processes that were carried out with some illustrations um, uh, in the context of the authenticity of the original material, because uh, one of the um, sort of driving forces behind this film is the idea that you can get back to what was originally in front of the camera in a more immediate and authentic fashion. And um, I think that uh, one could certainly uh, question um, how successful that might have been. So uh, I think we'll have a look at a few pictures um, and then we can uh, <clears throat> make a, a judgment. So um, unfortunately, I can't really show moving images over the uh, over the the uh, the, um, <clears throat> the airwaves, but uh, we'll make do with some stills. So this is uh, a scan from the um, the preservation master of one of the films that um, that he used in the film. Um, and uh, the quality is, is, is reasonably good. Um, it looks very much like a, a film still. Um, so now <clears throat> this is how the same shot appears in the uh, Peter Jackson film. And certainly you can't deny that it is immediately more uh, engaging for a modern audience. Uh, it has color, it has depth in a way. Um, 
and there's no longer that the, uh, the, the sort of pattern of grain and scratches that you um, typically see on on old material. Um, but if we're talking about authenticity, it's important to remember that there is no way of authentically colorizing an image of this sort. For instance, here, uh, you'll notice that the uh, building on the right um, is being painted blue. Now, there's no reason why that should have been done beyond the fact that the people doing the colorization thought it looked nice. Uh, there's no, there will be no um, documentary evidence that the uh, that building was blue. And similarly, this uh, child, um, the garment um, that the child's wearing, um, who knows what color it was. Uh, the, uh, the team making the film uh, also decided it was blue. Um, and again, uh, because if they'd left it as say a gray, um, a gray garment, it would have looked really rather dull. It just has more impact like this. Um, other things that uh, were done were to use um, extreme blow, up, blow ups of parts of images. And, and this is very much because um, they really needed some way of illustrating uh, parts of the film that there simply is no footage. Um, for instance, uh, where there's hand-to-hand -hand fighting, there is no footage of, of actual combat from the First World War that's authentic. So um, what the filmmakers did, what Peter Jackson did, was counterpoint the descriptions with images of soldiers um, sometimes looking a little concerned, as this one does. Um, actually, you'll see that this is just a very small part of this image. And the moment where he is stopped smiling is actually very fleeting in the original. Most of the time, he's grinning away like the rest of them. And there he is. <laughs> uh, but I mean, I don't think we have any particular uh, quarrel with this. Uh, this is a normal sort of practice of making a, a, this kind of film to, to reappropriate um, material uh, in this fashion. Um, perhaps slightly more worrying are things like this. Um, so this is a, um, some footage used to illustrate a, a, a raid by a small party of people going across uh, no man's land into the uh, German trenches. Um, uh, we know who filmed this and more or less where and when. Um, and the original is actually looks like this. Um, so what they did was to zoom in on the uh, on the uh, on the action, and then do rather odd things like uh, paint in the explosions to make them look a bit more um, well. I'm not sure a bit more like Hollywood explosions uh, rather than authentic explosions, and add a little bit of interest to the sky, little white puffy clouds and and a blue sky. Um, but slightly more worrying perhaps is the fact that. Uh, the uh, foreground, they've decided to paint in a whole load of barbed wire, which isn't easily visible in the original. Um, there is barbed wire there, but you can't really see it. So in order to make it more impactful, they've put their own barbed wire in. So this is um, very much a case of taking um, the original as source material and building some kind of uh, semi-fictionalized version of it. Um, in order to illustrate uh, a, a narrative stream in the in the film, um, the the film itself, uh, they shall not grow old, is a rather odd thing um, because uh, about a third of it is actually in black and white, and um, Peter Jackson is perhaps a little dishonest here in that uh, in order to um, get to the point where he uh, unveils his colorized, uh, tidied up version on the big screen. He shows uh, the first half hour of the, of the um, footage um, at the wrong speed without any kind of um, restoration um, in order to, to um, have that moment of uh, contrast where it melds into the, the new version. And of course, this is a bit of 
a cheat because um, showing film, there's no real excuse for showing film at the wrong speed beyond the fact that uh, he wanted to make it look like uh, everyone's idea of old film. Um, and then he unveils uh, his new look. Um, but it's much more than just colorization that uh, they carried out. In order to get to this point, they had to do uh, quite a lot to the, um, the black and white images. And this is where it gets a little bit tricky because um, although Peter Jackson quite clearly doesn't consider um, the final colorized material as being restored, although um, uh, and he has occasionally let slip the word, um, I don't think he uh, actually considers it like that. He, he's made it very clear that he, he sees it as a, um, a reuse of the, of the material um, in a creative way. Um, what he does seem to consider to be a restoration is um, this kind of process where the original has been um, completely degrained, sharpened up, tidied up, um, and turned into something that looks like a modern digital image. Um, and uh, part of this process involves changing the, um, the actual frames of the material, because um, the, uh, if you try to make a film that has to run at 24 frames a second, um, which is pretty much what modern digital cinema um, requires, uh, modern digital cinema won't allow you to show films uh, at slower speeds, which are the speeds that typically these films are shot at originally. Um, you, you can't show, say, uh, a film shot at 17 frames a second at 24 frames a second without changing the speed unless you actually do something about that. And what, um, uh, what people generally tend to do these days is use very sophisticated software systems to um, recreate um, 24 brand new frames out of the 17 frames that were there before, um, which means, in fact, that every single frame is um, an in inauthentic recreation of the original. Um, it, uh, it can be argued that the result of this sort of smoothing process gives you something that is closer to the original because it doesn't have grain on it, um, as indeed the original doesn't, uh, what was in front of the camera didn't have grain on it. Um, but the software that he used can be a bit tricky. If you look at this person uh, rushing across the uh, image on bottom right, um, the software that tries to tidy up the, um, the frame rate um, doesn't know what to do with that and it becomes a massive artifact. Um, and yeah, there are a couple of other things that, are, that one can argue um, change the look of the image. Uh, um, the, this man in the middle smoking a cigarette in the new version, he seems to be now smoking a giant spliff, which is slightly un likely in the context. Um, rather more worryingly, um, there were some things that were changed um, completely. Uh, for instance, the bird in the sky here has been removed completely. Um, but uh, this area here, uh, if we look at the, the same area and the new and the old, you'll see that um, at the back, the trees have changed, the fields at the back have changed, and actually uh, many of the buildings in the village have changed. Now, oddly enough, there didn't seem to be any reason for doing this, but it does um, highlight the fact that this is, not, um, this is not taking the original footage and producing something that is closer to the original. This is actually creating something uh, that is fictionalized which is uh, not necessarily related to the original at all in certain aspects. Um, so I think that we can be very clear that um, what Peter Jackson did was, um, as I say, uh, use the original footage as a reference in order to make uh, some, in, very, in, in some cases, some completely um, new um, uh, images that were 
um, that suited his requirements rather than got you closer to what was there originally. And um, I think that's all I have to say. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Matt and David. Um, very fascinating to learn more about the behind the scene of this project. Um, we have a number of questions for you, so I'll hand it back to Irem for the first question. Hello, first of all, thank you for that great presentation. Um, I will start us off with the first question that we have. Um, one of the things that struck me the most was seeing the curious looks of the soldiers and the silly faces they were making at the camera. What made this film stand out from the other war documentaries I've seen was the aspect of humanity. Seeing the faces of the youth and the gruesome things they experienced made me empath empathize with the dread and hope these young men were experiencing. So how did you experience the emotional side of working on this documentary, especially in combination with the voiceovers and the color grading? I think it's it's an interesting point about the, 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 the men who appear in the film because it's clear that they are often aware of their roles as protagonists in a film as well as being soldiers. And um, they do often pull faces or wave or smile at the camera, they're, they're acting up theatrically. Um, but it's more than just interacting with the camera operator. You know, that in a way, they're actually communicating with cinema audiences back home, possibly friends and family. And I think Peter Jackson takes advantage of this as well, because in a number of frames, he actually zooms in on these particular faces in group shots as well to kind of, sh it also shows the kind of harsh dental reality of the time as well and, and complexions as well, which are quite interesting, which you don't see so much these days. Um, I think what's also interesting is what he does as well is with the lip readers. So often there's a scene as well when a soldier is in the trench and, and waves towards the camera lens. Um, and you can actually see um, what he says there via the, via the intervention of a lip reader. And he says, it's the pictures mate. So lip readers can extract more detail that perhaps wasn't known about at the time or certainly wasn't understood at, at the time when the film would have originally been screened with a musical accompaniment or perhaps uh, a historical lecture that might have gone over the top of it. I mean, I think the emotional angle is kind of added and augmented by the First World War oral histories that are, are mainly in our collection and that of the BBC. But I think it was really quite a savvy move to use those. Um, but it's also quite problematic as well, because these interviews were, were often conducted 50, 60, even 70 years after the events that they're describing. Um, and, and in the same way that the film is edited, the sound interviews are obviously edited as well to kind of leverage maximum emotional impact. And it's certainly true that these first-hand experiences are powerful and, and when they're used in a collage-like manner with dozens and dozens of different voices, it does create a powerful effect and kind of animates the movie. Um, and I think it really underpins the film, perhaps arguably more so than some of the technical work that was undertaken with the colorization or the interpolation of frames or the mattifying of grain. Um, I think when I first saw it, I mean, I was very much aware of the devices that Peter Jackson was using to achieve this effect. And if anything, I felt a little and alienated from the footage because it was something that was very familiar to me, made strange. Um, were the eyes that color? Were the hair, was the hair that color? Um, it, it, it's about unknowability. Um, it's about artifice, but in pursuit of a more powerful viewing experience. And it's this strange, um, kind of conflagration of authenticity, fidelity meets artifice and reconstruction that I find really quite difficult to grasp. Yeah, I think I would uh, just add that um, uh, I think it's interesting what Matt was saying about uh, those of us who are familiar with the original footage, seeing it used, uh, manipulated in this way. Uh, and um, one of the issues that Peter Jackson obviously uh, faced is that he really wanted to get you um, to um, to uh, be uh, sort of sympathetic to the to the uh, the common British soldier, 
and there are virtually no uh, close-ups of, of of soldiers in the in the whole of the uh, the film collection. It's mostly um, medium to long shots and group shots, which is why he had to do this uh, business of zooming right in. But I think it's also um, very much a case in point that a lot of the emotional impact comes not uh, from the soundtrack, but it's not just from the oral histories. It's from the the use of uh, a very um, uh, a very impressive sound design with the sound effects, the the voices dubbed on, and, and so on, which uh, which gives this uh, real immediacy. Um, um, and I often looked at this film and thought this would work really well as a radio documentary um, without without the images at all and it would still have very much the same um, emotional impact thank you so much also i think my response was a bit different from yours because i'm not much of a war geek myself so it's one of the first war documentaries i had seen so for me the added sound design and the color was quite like um how do I say it, like, uh, not eye-opening, but just different to what I expect from war documentaries. But yes, so thank you so much. And I will hand over the mic to Akhil for our next question. <laughs> yeah, before going deeper into the ethics of digital restoration, I think it's important to truly understand the historical context and the historical usage of the films used in They Shall Not Grow Old. My question is therefore twofold and concerns the history of the film footage, but equally their archival life. Could you first of all tell us something about the historical film's production background and how these films were originally shown to a public? And secondly, in the later life as archival objects, have these films been used and viewed prior to Jackson's project? I'll start this one, David, if you don't mind. Um, do. Yeah, the, I mean, nearly all of the material that Peter Jackson used is what we would classify as official film. Um, it was shot mainly by former newsreel cameramen who were given the honorary rank of a lieutenant um, in the British Army. Um, and this was material that was shot essentially for propaganda purposes. It was made under the auspices of the Ministry of Information during the First World War. Um, and this would have been screened in cinemas as part of newsreels, short films. Um, and it was those audiences would have gone to the cinema, not only for entertainment, but also to understand a little bit more about current affairs and what was happening to loved ones back home. Because I think we need to remember cinema was a, a kind of a medium of mass communication 100 years ago. Your cinema audiences were in there, you know, tens of millions each week, there were you know four or five thousand cinemas in this country. So it was a great way to convey what was happening um, in the conflict to audiences back home. Um, I mean, we've had these films for over a hundred years now, and you know since their very earliest days when we had mutoscopes in the museum premises, people were able to view this material. Um, we then had a cinema that could be viewed on our premises, on Steambex later. We supplied these kind of films to documentary filmmakers. Um, and of course, with the advent of digitization, which David was closely involved in and the Europeana project, we were able to digitize nearly all of our first World War holdings. And all of this material is now accessible online. Um, so this material has always been available, but just via different platforms over the decades. Okay. Um, no, no, sorry. Go on. I was going to say there was a, the second part of your question was about um, uh, how the films were used and viewed um, prior to um, Peter Jackson's yeah, project. If, if at um, all, indeed at all. Um, but it's probably one for Matt to answer as well. Sorry, Matt. I mean, they have been used before. Um, they've been used in a, in a number of um, quite well-known documentary series and by documentary filmmakers, particularly in the 80s, 90s and 2000s. So they certainly did have a life before um, Peter Jackson used them. But I think what Peter Jackson was able to do is we were able to supply to him hundreds of films. Most documentary filmmakers don't have the luxury or the budget 
to be able to have access to that sheer volume of material. So Peter Jackson was privileged in that he was able to select from the vast array of material. Um, most of it, I, I wouldn't say was unseen or even rarely seen, but I think what he was able to do, he was able to perhaps really go into detail and select sequences that perhaps weren't quite so well known, even to people like me and my colleagues who work with the material regularly. He might have picked out something that was taking place in the corner of a frame that wasn't immediately obvious and draw attention to that. Sometimes the little smaller, more intimate details. Um, and I think he was very good at using film in a different way. Yeah, I think it's also worth mentioning that um, the first real extensive use of the uh, the First World War collection was probably in the BBC's Great War series from the uh, from 1964, I think it was, uh, which was a, a, an extensive history of the First World War. And the idea of um, uh, using uh, archive footage in a slightly less than um, perfectly authentic manner uh, is clearly uh, goes back at least till that till then uh, because uh, one of the decisions that was taken at the time uh, was that it would confuse the audiences if uh, troops were seen advancing in different directions so in order to make sure that the British always direct advanced in one direction and the Germans in another they uh, sometimes turned the film uh, around reversed it so that uh, the troops are heading in the right way. So you know, there's, um, you can't believe anything uh, from any period, it would seem. Interesting. Thank you so much. And now I'll pass the mic to Megan for the next question. Thank you, Achil. Hello. So in one of the essays we had to uh, read to prepare for today's session, Reclaiming Heritage, Colorization, Culture Wars, and the Politics of Nostalgia by Paul Grange. He states that there are two main areas of debate or discussion in the archive world when it comes to restoration. The first being the aesthetic debate, whether it's immoral or moral and should be done, and the legal debate, questioning the degree of control one has over another's original work and if it can be done. So I'm just curious as to what your takes are in regard to these debates of ethics and authenticity and rest restoration. Um, well, it's, of course, what Grange is writing about mostly is um, the, uh, the colorization of, um, of works, cinematic, uh, cinematic works. Um, so it's rather different from what uh, we're talking about here. Um, and, Certainly, uh, um, as I represent FIAF, we uh, are very interested in uh, trying to um, educate people on what restoration should be and uh, what the ethical limits are. Uh, and in fact, um, there's a document has uh, just recently been um, posted on the FIAF website covering this very issue. Um, and it's there are some there are some real difficulties about this that uh, Giovanni Fossati uh, alluded to in the, uh, in her introduction, um, because what uh, audience audiences would have seen on the screen uh, at the time of a film's first release uh, was the result of uh, a, a long production chain. Um, it was the end. Um, the end process in a, a, a series of um, technical uh, manipulations, starting with the original negative and working through to a final print with soundtrack. Um, what uh, restorers love to do is get hold of the original camera negatives, um, scan those at very high resolution, and then they end up with something that is um, distinctly better in technical terms than the anything that would have been seen at the time. And uh, this is a, a fairly intractable problem because um, restorers then are unlikely to want to degrade their images in order to try and mimic the look of the uh, slightly uh, less 
high quality print that would have been seen, seen by audiences. So uh, this, this can lead to some real problems with things that were, were never expected to have been seen by the audience, such as wires holding up models and so on. Um, uh, you know, uh, some of the, uh, the, the sets not looking very impressive, which wouldn't have been apparent in the original. Um, so yeah, I mean uh, the uh, the whole issue of um, uh, ethics and authenticity in restoration, film restoration, is something that uh, divides archivists um, amongst themselves. Um, whether it matters to the general public, um, who um, you may argue that uh, someone watching a restored film will quickly forget the technical aspects of the restoration and will be immersed in the content of the film anyway. So why should it matter? I mean, I think I'd just add a little bit about the, the legal aspect of that question. I mean, the material itself is crown expired. It's effectively out of copyright. Um, and the camera operators at the time as well wouldn't have had the copyright in that material, it was the it was the British government effectively who, who owned that material. And um, so it's not like Citizen Kane, where you might have a director or a lighting director, a costume set designer who all who all might have had a, a part to play in bringing this film to bear. Um, I do think the question of moral rights is, is more complex and it's quite a difficult terrain. Um, some of my kind of concerns do relate to some other films in our collections that we would consider public records. Um, and what do we do when we alter them? Um, we need to be, I think we need to be transparent about what we're doing with the film, what's actually happening to it. Um, and what do these color versions actually mean for our understanding of the past? Um, do they supersede them if they become the sort of dominant imagery? Um, if lots of people just start circulating it and this is what people want to see, I think it can kind of create an alternative canon. Um, and that probably tells us a lot more about the present than it does about the past. Particularly if you're adding colour, you're taking grain away, you're removing some of the, the, the materiality of how things were originally shot. Um, you might not actually realise it was shot on film if you were to watch Peter Jackson's film, unless you understood a little bit about the history of cinema and film technology. So I think there are quite a lot of debates and arguments here that are difficult to unravel. Um, and it's not something that we take lightly um, when we enter into this kind of relationship. Definitely, I agree. Thank you for sharing. And now I'll pass the mic to Jarvis. Hi there. Um, so you've touched upon what my question is going to be about already, but maybe we can get into some more specifics. So in a BBC making of special, Peter Jackson expressed his motivation for why he wanted to work on the project by saying that he wanted, um, they, the soldiers, didn't see the war in black and white, um, they saw it in colour. And his aim was to stop the soldiers being a black and white cliche to bring their humanity back. This drew my attention to what is a fundamental discussion and um, question that surrounds film restoration. And that is, as a restorer, are you restoring the film itself or what was originally in front of the camera? Um, uh, and use, both of you echoed this point similarly in a FIAF symposium in 2019. Uh, you expressed your concern that the level of restoration that Jackson achieved before the colorization, i.e. the frame rate fixes, the grain removal and the dust removal would be expected of the material in your collection as a whole. So how wanted to ask how does this level, level of restoration affect the medium specificity of film and the future of film uh, and the historical as a historical document within the archive um let me try and say something about this um yeah as you say we have touched on some of this before um i, I think uh, as i said uh it will always be impossible to re recreate what was in front of the camera um, from the surviving images. There's simply uh, not sufficient information in those images to tell you um, certain things, such as what colour uh, the original uh, subject was. Um, 
and the uh, resolution of the images is such that only a certain level of uh, detail can be achieved. Um, and if you look at the uh, Michael Jackson film, you will see, um, you'll be aware uh, probably throughout the whole thing that there's a sort of slightly odd, um, I call it a smeary look about it whenever there's some movement. This is uh, very much to do with the, um, the software used to change the frame rate in order to get the uh, film to run at, uh, uh, to get the subjects to move at the right speed when they're shown at the wrong speed, if you see what I mean. Um, so the, um, yeah, so there's no question that he's um, getting you closer to uh, looking through an open window at exactly what was there at, at the time. Uh, in many ways, he's getting you uh, further away um, from that that ideal, which is absolutely unobtainable. Um, I think that we have to keep in mind that the, uh, the primary source for all this footage uh, are the surviving original frames on, on film. Uh, the problem with that is that they uh, are only accessible through uh, a non-transparent medium of some sort, originally um, through a printing, printing process and then projection in a cinema. These days, by digitization and display on some kind of uh, digital system, um, so you're um, you're never actually going to see the original material um, as such. Um, there's always going to be something in in the way uh, between you and and what was what uh, what's being presented. Um, so uh, it's, this is not exactly a new problem. What digital, modern digital technology does, of course, is uh, open the field so much that um, pretty soon anybody can do anything they want with original images and there will never be, um, you will never be uh, confident uh, unless you're absolutely um, nailed down the uh, the authenticity of uh, of who's presenting this to you you'll never be confident that you're seeing um, what was there originally even in the original footage yeah I mean I think I'd just add that um, although Peter Jackson doesn't re refer really to what he does so much as a restoration I mean he certainly uses techniques that you would associate with archival restorations um, but it's not what we would call a film restoration if it's anything it's a hyper restoration ultra restoration um, it's something very different and he also talked about you know trying to make the film look like it was shot last week but it doesn't really look like it was shot last week it's it's a hybrid it has the original photo chemical um, imagery plus the additional work that he's done and he's created a, a kind of synthetic textured film that has a, a, has a strange kind of um, visual kind of weirdness. It's compelling in some respects, but other times the artifact artifacts that actually appear that have been mentioned before actually distance you from it. It draws you in and then at other times it pulls you away. It, it makes you very much aware of the whole spectacle of what's going on. And I think that's very much embedded in what he's, he's doing here. Um, I don't think it's going to affect the way we carry out restorations at the Imperial War Museum, um, but I think it does raise issues about perhaps what we might want to do with some of the um, black and white cleaned up imagery that David showed earlier um, and what questions that raises for us as an archive, if people actually would rather use that material than the source material. And I think that's quite a vexing question for us. Um, and it's something that we haven't had to wrestle with yet, but I imagine it will happen further down the line. Cool. Thank you very much for your answers there. Yeah, I think, like you said, that'll be an interesting question that might come up again when another generation of filmmakers look to use this material. Um, unfortunately, our other classmate, Freddie, couldn't be here today, so I'll be asking his question on his behalf. So this is our final question for today. Um, as both of you know, the technologies used in the restoration of these old films 
are becoming more and more advanced as the sophistication of the technology increases and the films become more lifelike. A large proportion, perhaps sometimes a majority of the discussion and chat surrounding the films is about the advancement of this technology. Read my own hand right here. <laughs> uh, so do you see uh, this as a problem? And do you think that, is it possible to discuss this film without discussing the uh, technological innovations, uh, discuss it as a historical document? I, mean, I don't necessarily see that as a problem. I mean, I think part of what we wanted to do was create a splash um, ha have an impact with with an international audience. I mean, I think the film was originally was intended to be screened, really. Um, in cinemas, it was more for a television release. It was only when the film um, tripled in length to be 90 minutes that it had a cinematic um, life beyond what we'd originally planned. Um, so it was very much about getting people talking. And I think people talking about the technology, the digital intervention, is arguably just as important as the historical content itself. I mean, I, I would say that as a, as a film curator, for me, trying to explain what we do um, in archives is important, how we operate, how we work. And I think if we could try and get people to understand a little bit more about the, the specificities, the, the issues we face, I think that's that's all, go all good. Um, it's not no so much that I think it kind of means we can't discuss the content, the concepts, the context, and the historical document in its own right. I just think it allows us to view the film um, from different perspectives. So I don't really see it as a problem. Um, I, I think the two complement one another. Um, and I think increasingly, you know, we're seeing this with colorization apps or neural filters. This is technology that people you know, in their own living rooms at a bus stop with their phone can access now. It's something that is becoming, um, you know, part of mainstream life, people changing photographic imagery, film imagery. It's, it's not as expensive as it once was. So I think the technological aspect is going to be a talking point for a number of a number of years and, until we move into, I guess, a post-digital landscape. Yes, I think that um, although the the colorization and the, the processing is the thing that draws the audiences in, uh, if you read people's comments about this film, um, once they get past the sort of ooh moment where it all turns into um, uh, sort of a smooth video color, um, it, what most people seem to comment about is the fact that it really brings the first world war to life. They really are, sort of um, are able to empathize with the with the, the people involved. And it's actually, um, it, it's not really the, the colorization or the smoothing out that's doing that. It's the story that's being told. And it, it you know, it's a, it's a, it's a well told narrative. Uh, and if you strip away the uh, colorization and the video look and just presented the film in its uh, original form, I think you would have been left with very much, um, uh, you would probably gain the same reactions for people who actually sat down to watch it. Um, it's actually would then be a fairly conventional documentary of the sort that's been um, created a number of times in the past. Um, and, you know, people would still um, react to it in very much the same way. I could I be wrong there. <laughs> no, I, I agree, but I, I I just don't think not nowhere near as many people would have viewed this film, even though it was directed by Peter Jackson, if it wasn't for the kind of technological, you know, restorative processes that he used to capture the public's imagination. If it had just been about the colorization, the interpolation, the cleaning up, and the story was poor, it would have done badly. But I think it was a mixture of both things that got audiences through the door and enabled them to to enjoy and generally enjoy the production. Perfect. Thank you so much for answering our questions today. Uh, I'll hand back over to Giovanna to wrap up today's session. Hey, thank you, David and Matt, very much for being with us today. Uh, well, I wish you were here with us in Amsterdam, but we'll uh, figure out a new topic to invite you back in Amsterdam next year. Um, Thank you, Achille, uh, Jarvis, 
uh, Irem, Megan, Megan and Freddy uh, for your introduction and questions. And thank you to the 24 students following online. Um, as usual, thank you very much to my colleagues here at I. And uh, um, I hope to see you back with us for the next uh, uh, This Is Film session on the reuse of uh, archival film material by the VJ. We'll have the Italian VJ and film scholar Rossella Catanese, who will be uh, mixing um, the unique bits and pieces collection held here at iFilm Museum. Um, so see you soon. Uh, take care. Bye-bye.